Welcome, everyone. My name is Erin Lurie. We're so glad that you can join us tonight. We're going to take just a few minutes as folks are being admitted to the webinar by Zoom. We're thrilled to start the Great Homes and Gardens series tonight. Welcome folks. We are still getting some more folks admitted into the webinar. We'll get started in just a few minutes. All right. Kate Markert, I'm going to invite to come on screen and introduce this evening's program. Thank you so much, Erin. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. I'm Kate Markert. I'm the executive director uh, at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. I want to thank Hillwood members for their ongoing support. And I invite those of you who are not yet members to join today. It's really easy to do right on our website. Each year, I certainly look forward to escaping dreary cold February with our Great Homes and Gardens series. And I hope you'll join me each Thursday, we really need it this year, to explore extraordinary sites and stories. On February 12th, we explore New York's Untermeyer Gardens with Stephen Burns. On February 18th, Cara Newport, will introduce us to Filoli in California. And on February 25th, we'll discover extraordinary and often overlooked sites preserved by the National Trust's African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund with its director, Brett Legs. Brett is an exceptional speaker who's been featured in a TED radio hour as well as on NPR. Brett was one of the folks instrumental in preserving the mansion built by Madam C.J. Walker, Villa Luaro. I highly recommend the fabulous lecture Alelia Bundles presented on Villa Luaro last year. It's available on, our, available on our YouTube channel, along with a whole lot of other programs. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's program which begins with an extraordinary documentary about the life of Paul R. Williams. The filmmakers, Royal Kennedy Rogers and Kathy McCampbell Vance are with us tonight and look forward to taking your questions. Royal Kennedy Rogers is a producer, director and writer with experience in local and network news as well as public broadcasting experience. She reported for NBC in New Orleans, Cleveland, and Chicago before moving to ABC Network News. She's covered breaking news, presidential politics, the entertainment industry, and everything in between. Now an independent producer, Royal won an, a local Emmy and has been recognized by the San Francisco State School of Journalism and the American Association of Trial Lawyers. Kathy McCampbell Vance is an Emmy Award winning producer specializing in news, entertainment, and documentaries. She spent more than 20 years at Washington's NBC News 4, rising through the ranks from trainee reporter to director of programming, community affairs, and broadcast standards. Since leaving NBC 4, she has continued to produce special news series and high profile interviews for NBC, BET, and more. Kathy has been recognized by the National Black Media Coalition for her contributions to journalism. And now, please enjoy Hollywood's architect, the Paul R. Williams story. All right, one moment. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties at the moment, um, but we will be joined shortly by Royal. I am so glad to be here with Kathy right now. 
Um, and to take your questions, we have a couple coming in, but I do hope that we'll hear from more of you. If you move the mouse or tap your screen, depending on your device, you should see a little box pop up with a Q&A symbol. That is the best place to send your questions, and we are looking forward to getting to those. To start, Kathy, I'd like to you know, point out here we are at the beginning of Black History Month. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Paul Williams' impact on the African American community and how he was starting out and continue, you know, from, from his very start to today. Well, you saw in the film some specific things that he did within the Black community. Um, the um, Broadway Federal Savings Bank, not only did he participate in the establishment of that bank, but he designed the building itself. Um, all over the United States, he did things within the Black community in addition to spectacular buildings and, and homes for Hollywood stars. Um, I had some personal experience. I was a student at Howard University Law School for three years and only found out recently that Paul Williams designed the building that I took all of my classes in. And in fact, he was also on the board of directors of Howard University, uh, of, of the entire university. Uh, another personal story, during the war, we noted that he designed um, military uh, installations. And one of those was at Fort Huachuca in Arizona, where my father was a soldier. And the um, facilities were segregated then. So as an African-American soldier, he was not allowed to go to any of the places that the white soldiers were. One of the buildings that Paul designed was something called the Green Top, which was almost a spectacular uh, recreation center where the soldiers could dance and, and you know, hear music. And uh, much to my mother's chagrin, I think my father spent a lot of time there and who knew that Paul Williams was impacting my personal life then. But, but it was his impact on the black community and the black soldiers that made a difference. And we have Royal now. Hi, I'm terribly sorry. My uh, iPad, the, the Wi-Fi went out, so I'm on my phone, which is much more dependable. Um, anyway, uh, thank you for uh, taking over, Kathy, and uh, doing such a great job at the beginning. Would you like to ask uh, one of the questions again? Or um... Yes, absolutely. Um, actually, I, I'll move on to the next question because I'd love to hear a little bit from you about how your identity as African-American producers impacted how you told the story, creative decisions in creating the film or just your personal connection with the subject? Well, uh, we definitely wanted to um, tell the story from an African-American point of view. And a lot of what had been written uh, about Paul Williams, uh, especially you know, in the design magazines and uh, uh, the style magazines are, are rightfully focused on architect to the stars, um, the homes he had done for celebrities, the Beverly Hills Hotel, which uh, uh, was absolutely wonderful. Uh, and they would mention uh, the fact that he had to uh, draw upside down to uh, make sure the clients weren't uh, uncomfortable uh, sitting next to him. But we wanted to um, go uh, in depth into what an, the African-American community uh, wanted to know about. And so we, we uh, definitely wanted to um, uh, talk about how um, uh, he got started uh, 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 you heard Professor um, Henderson saying that uh, he found out that um, most white architects would uh, only take one or two paths and they would have a job. And Paul Williams had to work harder, had to uh, basically follow every single uh, path um, uh, that he could to become an architect. Uh, we, um, we also wanted to uh, highlight uh, uh, 
one of the uh, few times that we could see that he expressed em emotion. Uh, uh, and uh, that was when he wrote about not being able to live in, um, in the neighborhoods he knew he could afford. So it was that kind of thing. Uh, Kathy, I'm sure you have some um, uh, points too. Yeah, well, you know what? There are many hardships with being independent producers, but there are some joys as well. And one of those joys is you get to tell the story as you view it um, with the creative freedom to be honest and authentic without the interference of corporate entities. And I will say that as we viewed the story, uh, PBS, almost without exception, accepted it as we presented it. Um, we had the luxury of having our own crew, our own team. So there was Royal Me and our associate producer, an African-American woman. Um, our cameramen were African-American men. Our editor, our primary editor was African-American man. And while we did have diversity throughout the production, there was input that each of these individuals was be able was able to bring in from their own experience as African Americans. You know, we would do an interview and each of us brought our own emotions to the story. And it was not unusual for us to wrap up our Q and A and the cameraman would say, well, wait a minute, this was an experience that I had. What do you think about that? So the teamwork, the unity, of, of a way of thinking really did help us tell the story in what we thought was a, an effective way. I certainly agree with that. And I will project the feelings coming from the question box over here that you have done that so successfully. Lots of folks are hungry for more. Oh. Ellen asked if there's a Paul Williams tour that could be taken in LA or if there were any other books or films that you would recommend? Well, well uh, so. uh, there, um, I don't think there's an official tour um, uh, of uh, Paul Williams buildings, but I think you can go online and kind of piece together for yourself, um, a, almost like a self-guided tour of, uh, uh, of Paul Williams locations um, around the city. Um, you know, uh, the Beverly Hills Hotel, uh, the MCA headquarters building, um, the Hollywood Y, the 28th Street Y. Um, uh, if you Google Paul Williams, a lot of times you can sort of piece together um, a tour for yourself. And his granddaughter, Karen Hudson has written several books as a matter of fact about her, her grandfather. And so those books are available too. And, and as more and more information has come out about Paul Williams, um, it's, it's easier to find. Um, well, you wanna talk about the Getty. Um, I was just about to uh, mention that. Uh, one of the wonderful things um, uh, that happened um, uh, over the summer was that the, um, Getty Museum and the Getty Research Institute together with the USC School of Architecture bought the archives. And this is extremely important because the archives were in the family possession and uh, they took incredible care of them. Uh, but you know, there's a, a big difference uh, between uh, being uh, in a home no matter how well you, you and careful you are and being in a real uh, uh, research um, environment with uh, temperature control and humidity control. And uh, so uh, not only will they be preserved, all of those blueprints and drawings and uh, that legacy, the artistic legacy, but um, hopefully uh, once the Getty has taken stock of what um, they have and and uh, cataloged everything, hopefully there will be exhibits and, and, um, and uh, the public will be able to see these things. 
We are getting lots of fantastic, great questions in right now. Um, I'm gonna skip down to this one. Paul Revere's Williams work encompasses so many different architectural styles. Is there anything that he designed that really reflected an African sensibility and aesthetics? Actually, um, uh, his style was um, so intertwined. Um, you know, he mixed all the periods, but there is um, a Moorish uh, influence that you see in some of the homes, especially um, the, the ceiling motif. And uh, uh, the, uh, that influence came from Northern Africa to Spain. And I am not an expert in this. In fact, uh, um, uh, one of our homeowners um, uh, know, knew a lot more about this than, uh, than I did. But that was the only um, design influence. But I, I do want to say that, uh, of course, he incorporated African-American history in, lot, in a lot of other ways, like the murals um, uh, at the um, Golden State Building. Uh, and um, the, um, uh, I guess they're called friezes um, on the outside of the uh, 28th Street Y, so that um, young um, African-American uh, uh, young men and boys um, would see the images of Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass as they walked in every day. And he hoped that would inspire them. And again, at Langston Terrace, uh, same thing. There were friezes of black historical figures at the public housing um, facility in Washington, Langston Terrace. And actually V, one of our wonderful members and docents, uh, submitted a question saying that she grew up in Langston Terrace and she knew that it was special, but the, those sculptures, the animal sculptures, the outdoor staircase um, were, were things that really stood out to her. And she wondered if that was typical of his work to use that sculpture and art as a core part of the building. I would say definitely yes. He loved um, pretty things. <laughs> uh, he he did um, uh, uh, like to um, add elements that uh, not only made things softer and more beautiful and more pleasant, but said something about um, where you were. The the, the um, I have been to Langston Terrace and it's actually uh, uh, beautiful. There's a, a wide open spaces as you as you walk up and then at the uh, uh, back of the uh, of the development there is that uh, freeze depicting African American history and um, I uh, want to say that um, uh, some of these same elements I, I saw on uh, at the little townhouses there a little curved balustrade or a little uh, awning you know, you would see um, this was public housing, but he wanted the residents to have something uh, beautiful. And you see those same elements uh, in Beverly Hills and Hancock Park. I love that. We have several folks who have asked if you can speak a little bit about how you decided to take on this project and how you learned about Paul Williams and his work. Uh, absolutely. Well, I had actually never heard of Paul Williams until um, his granddaughter, uh, uh, Karen Hudson, did her uh, first book. And uh, the connection was that my husband went to college with her brother and uh, uh, she was uh, touring the country uh, on a book tour. And um, we had a book signing uh, party for her. And uh, when the books were sent ahead, I opened up the carton, I took out the book, and I couldn't believe uh, that um, a, an African-American architect uh, had done all of this work, and I'd never heard of him. Um, as a producer, the first thing I thought of was, this is a film, uh, and it was. And then I'm not sure if Kathy has uh, told about how she came to the project, but I, I started out alone, and fortunately, um, uh, I met Kathy and she joined me. Yes, I actually 
had heard of Paul Williams many years before on a trip to LA, I had met his grandson, Paul, Husband, Hus, Paul Hus, Hudson, and um, learned that his grandfather had designed the signature building or participated in the design of the signature building that I had just seen at LAX. And, you know, I was fascinated by that. Years later, I was at a social event with Royal and she was talking about the fact that she was about to produce a film on Paul Williams. I was the only one in the room who had heard of him. And I think she was surprised and I was surprised and thrilled to find that someone else had discovered him. Um, I told Royal then, you know, whatever I can do to help you, I I'm here for you because I want the story to be told. Um, it started out with me giving her a fundraiser and then eventually ended with me joining her in the project. And what a joy it has been to be able to tell this man's story. One of our visitors asks how long it took to complete this project from Genesis to its first airing just about a year ago on PBS SoCal. We hate this question. Maybe. I know. <laughs> <laughs> many, you, many. you go, Royal. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, um, it, it, it was many years. It, it was, um, uh, you know, 20 years in the making, really, from the time I first met Karen Hudson. And I used to be really self-conscious about it, but I found out that for independent productions where you have to, you know, uh, uh, you know, gather the story, do all the interviews Kathy and I did, raise your own money, uh, 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 pay attention to the business side, the legal side, that it is not unusual for it to take independent producers years and years, but it was, it was worth every year. <laughs> it was, but there were, there were times when there were down times. We, you know, you, you, you pay as you go. And so there were times when we were not doing production because there we needed to focus on raising money and, and doing other things. So it was a, a long labor of love, but we're happy we're here now. Well, I'm so glad that it worked out that your persistence and dedication over years brought it to us. You mentioned that um, Karen Hudson had been a part of that kind of genesis to, to keep working on this story. And I'm wondering if that is part of how the journal and diary entries came to be included in the film. That's something that several of our visitors have asked about. Yes, the, the, um, the, the um, uh, diary entries were extremely important because that you had Paul Williams' own words. And uh, uh, one of the things that actually uh, worried me at, at the beginning when I first heard the story was, it was just unbelievable. I, I just didn't see how I could um, make a film and the audience would actually believe it because as, as, as they say, it's like a Hollywood screenplay. But these were documented uh, writings of his that the family had. And then he had written a lot of um, uh, uh, newspaper and magazine articles over the years as he became well known. And those were again, once again, his own words. And then we had, we were lucky to have um, uh, uh, some uh, uh, people who had done academic research, Dr. Wesley Henderson, and of course, Dr. Lonnie Bunch, um, uh, who could validate that this was a real story and it had happened. So often when we would tell people the story, they literally didn't believe that this was true because it's, well, how could we not have heard about him? I, I can't imagine that, that, that this happened and we don't know about him. And they thought we were exaggerating. I hope I, Paul Williams first crossed my radar about two years ago. And that since then I've seen, there's a new photographer's book about Paul Williams homes, this film. And I hope that that will continue to grow. I know there's a mural being restored and supposed to be finished this year. And with the Getty's acquisitions of the archives, I do hope that this will continue to grow and be more common knowledge. Um, 
along those lines, a couple of folks asked about the, the loss of his design for St. Jude's and if there's any vestige of his work or a dedication to him, an acknowledgement at St. Jude's still. Well, uh, uh, the original St. Jude's uh, building is um, uh, sadly um, uh, gone. And uh, part of it, is, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, Marlo told us that uh, it was actually um, uh, kind of a medical technical reason that the original building, once they started using radiation, um, uh, just did not um, live up to the medical. It was beautiful, but they, uh, uh, they needed a new building to continue the research and the treatment. And so there is you know, a new building now. Um, I am actually uh, not sure because we have never been to um, uh, uh, St. Jude, but um, uh, I don't know. I can't imagine that they don't have some sort of um, tribute to Paul Williams in the new building because Marlo is, you saw how passionately she spoke and um, uh, she's very well you know, aware of the contribution that um, uh, he made, but that's a, that's a good uh, uh, point, something uh, to research and find out. I've gotten several questions about how many properties are designated with historic preservation societies, if, or um, this last one that came in is a little bit different, and that is whether there's a nonprofit or any sort of an organizing entity trying to get more of those houses designated as historic landmarks? Well, I can tell you this, um, uh, in uh, every city and especially Los Angeles, you know, you have your preservation groups. And so uh, uh, the LA Conservancy is very, uh, uh, that's their whole reason for existence, uh, uh, preserving uh, LA's architectural history. And uh, uh, they pay attention to um, every Paul Williams home and every Paul Williams building. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, they mount an effort and um, they, um, they aren't successful. I can tell you, sadly, um, uh, some of the uh, uh, homes um, and buildings that were standing when we started, started this documentary are no longer uh, standing. So I would make a plea <laughs> to, uh, to your members, um, support your preservation groups because um, you know once uh, uh, these treasures are gone, um, they're gone. The other issue is that there is no catalog of all of his buildings um, because those records were destroyed. So there is an effort to begin to identify what buildings he did. And I'm sure it's a, you know, hunt and peck kind of an experience, but th they seem to be making some headway. I think the well, Getty will help, that their uh, research uh, will help a lot. Along those lines of hoping for a catalog, um, we've gotten a couple of questions about what properties here in the DC area Paul Williams designed, I know, um, We've talked about a couple of them, including Kathy mentioned uh, Howard. Are there any others? Is there a list or a resource you would direct folks to? You know, I, I don't think there are any homes in the Washington area. Um, uh, I think, um, unfortunately, Howard, the buildings at Howard and um, Langston Terrace, which he did as a partnership. I, I do want to uh, uh, say that. Uh, I think, um, unfortunately, uh, I think that uh, that is uh, it as far as we know in the Washington area. There are a couple on the East Coast, uh, a school in New York, a couple of homes in upstate New York. Um, but um, I think that's it for the East Coast. 
In the film, you address the fact that Paul Williams couldn't live in the neighborhoods that he designed homes for and that he returned to a more modest, non-segregated neighborhood. Um, and Henrietta Keller is wondering which neighborhood in Los Angeles that was. Okay, so um, his, um, uh, the original house um, was, um, uh, it's no longer there, uh, 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 a, um, in a neighbor, a part of um, South LA uh, that um, where there were modest bungalows and uh, where he, raised his family until he went to um, Lafayette Square, uh, which was an area that was opening up um, to African-Americans. And uh, that's where he built uh, his own um, uh, house. Uh, the first time he, had, he could build from scratch and do exactly what he wanted or exactly what his wife wanted. And Karen lived in that house for a long time. Um, the interview that we did with her was in that home. Um, the staircase was behind her with the um, unusual workmanship on the, on the banister. Um, that was in his home. It must have been so hard to decide to leave that. I couldn't, I mean, the design is so beautiful, but to especially to have the family connection. Um, I can see why Karen stayed there for a long time. We've got a couple of what I hope are more rapid fire questions. Uh, Doug Weimer asked whether Mr. Williams did any design work in Palm Springs. Yes, a lot. Um, we, um, unfortunately, um, uh, we uh, couldn't include uh, uh, that for time purposes, but I will tell you this, uh, Paul Williams has a star on the Palm Springs Walk of Fame and uh, a very devoted fan base in Palm Springs. Um, the um, a Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz home uh, was in Palm Springs. Um, it is no longer standing, sadly. Um, and he did uh, a lot of uh, work with another architect um, uh, named A. Quincy Jones. And uh, uh, they did, uh, I think, uh, the Palm Springs uh, Tennis Club and um, uh, several others. But um, he did uh, uh, have a, uh, some work in Palm Springs. And if you go to Palm Springs, now that is where you can, uh, be, uh, because of his devoted fan base, it's easy to find out where, um, uh, where the buildings are. That's great. Henrietta Keller asked whether the Golden State Insurance Building still exists. Uh, yes, it does. Um, uh, it is uh, uh, no longer an insurance company, but it is, uh, it was, uh, taken over and um, renovated uh, by a, a social service agency that is part of the, uh, the city of Los Angeles. They did a wonderful renovation and then they put that little plaza uh, out back uh, in tribute to Paul Williams. We also got a question about whether the stall house existed. It looked very modernist to one of our members. Um, the stall house does exist, is still standing. Now remember he, uh, he, he was just instrumental in helping them get a loan. It's, if not um, the famous, um, most famous uh, modern house in um, the country, one of the most famous. And it was uh, made famous by a photographer named Julius Schulman. And uh, there is, uh, we showed it briefly, there is a, very famous picture of modernness of the house sitting out over the canyon, almost in space. And uh, uh, there are these two young uh, 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 women uh, in sort of cocktail dresses and they're just sitting there. And it, it's almost like the epitome 
of um, late 50s, um, early 60s uh, postmodernism. But it does exist and you can uh, take tours, I understand. Uh, the, the Stahl family still has it. Uh, it it's been used for a lot of uh, movies and photo shoots, but uh, every once in a great while, um, it's open to the public. That's fabulous. You spoke about that you included some of this in the film, but I'd love to hear about what it meant, what you hope um, budding architects, particularly people of color or other minorities, could take away from Paul Williams' story. Kathy? When, and his work. <laughs> yeah, when you consider the statistics that 2% of the architectural field are minorities, fewer than that, women. Um, it, it's a daunting task to realize that you're entering a field that is that um, unwelcoming, to, for lack of a better word. And, and we hope that the Paul Williams story helps young architects of color to understand that if he can do it, you can do it. Um, he was never ever discouraged. Yes, he felt discouragement. We know from his writings that he took this in, um, but he never let it get in the way of his achieving. He found ways to make it work. He didn't kowtow. He never sold himself out, but while staying true to himself, he also stayed true to his dream. And what he was able to do was to then provide dreams come true for his clients. And we just want every young person and not just African-Americans and not just architectural students to take this as a story of triumph and heroism and to be inspired by it. Well, I certainly was, and I'm certainly inspired by the film. Jennifer Lawson asked if there's a shorter version or a, um, a few clips that you could, might recommend, thinking that it would be great to share with students in elementary and secondary schools. You know, I have to say, Jennifer Lawson was so instrumental in our success. She, uh, uh, she's just not an ordinary <laughs> viewer. Uh, Jennifer Lawson was our godmother all along the way. Um, that is actually um, uh, something we're, we're working on now. Uh, we're trying to get, uh, uh, find a, a way to uh, bring this film to, um, uh, to students and um, have uh, uh, Paul Williams' story uh, inspire them. So um, Jennifer, we're working on it. <laughs> Well, I'm glad to know she's a known entity. I almost didn't ask because I'm sure that with an hour long film, plenty of things ended up on the cutting room floor. There's always more story than time. So I think I'd like to end this evening by asking each of you to share one of your favorite things that we didn't get to see this evening, something that just couldn't quite squeeze in that was perhaps your, your favorite part? Well, I've got one. It's called the Lion Gate House. And it, it was um, built, designed by Paul Williams in the 30s. It was a 9,000 square foot house. Years later, it was purchased by country singer Kenny Rogers. And he put two um, lion sculptures at the driveway, which is why it got its name. but. But in recent years, it was renovated to become a 24,000 square foot property, but all with Paul Williams in mind. And they really stayed true to his um, design, even preserving some of the rooms. Royal and I were able to tour it with the real estate agent. It was on the market at the time for $65 million. And she 
painstakingly walked us through the house and said, here's a Paul Williams element and here's one. And, you know, we, we weren't able to, to include that, but by the way, it did eventually sell for $50 million. And, you know, I always wonder what on earth would Paul Williams think that the bones of his, of this house, I mean, he really provided the structure for this house would end up blossoming into a $50 million property. And I don't know if we have enough time, but I, uh, one of my uh, favorite elements in a Paul Williams house that uh, uh, didn't make it uh, uh, into the film was, it just showed, it, it was so perfectly Paul Williams. In one of the uh, houses built in the twenties in uh, Hancock Park, um, he had put a, a telephone in, uh, in a little alcove. And at that time, if you even had a phone, there was one in the house. So uh, it was in this little alcove and typical Paul Williams, he thought about people using the phone and uh, with the living room on one side and people talking maybe if there was a dinner party and the dining room on, on, on one side. And so on each side of this little alcove, were these doors that shut. And when you went in, if you wanted privacy, Paul Williams had given you a phone booth. I love that. That's fabulous. Well, Royal and Kathy, thank you so much for joining us this evening and for sharing your film with us. This has been a real pleasure. And um, I, I could not be more thrilled to start our series with such a great story. Um, Thank you. And if I may, um, I'm going to brag a little bit. We just found out this week that our film received two nominations for the NAACP Image Awards. One was for narration, uh, Courtney B. Vance, and the other, shout out to my colleague, Royal, for writing. So. Everybody vote, vote for us to win, but th thank you for, for including us. Thank, you, thank you so much. And to everyone who joined us this evening, I'm so thrilled that you were here. I hope we'll see you again next Thursday and that you keep an eye on the Hillwood event calendar for other fabulous programs coming up. Thanks very much. Thank you, it was a pleasure.